Tonight's presentation, although edited for YouTube, contains imagery and subject matter some may find disturbing. While our program is educational, we still feel that viewer discretion is advised. Secrets concerning the son of beasts. I mean, you hate to think it might have happened, but did Kings Island hide the truth about the roller coaster's safety? Well, an engineer who inspected the ride says yes, and he's now telling his story tonight. The state investigator who examined the son of beasts says Kings Island put riders at risk. In a video deposition, Rick Schmizzi dissected photos of the wooden coaster and structural weak points right down to the loose bolts. Was, I could have spun it with my finger. And instead of shutting it down and treating the whole patient, a five-acre coaster, they took a Band-Aid approach. It was more of a, let's see what we can do to kind of make it work along the way. And I thought that was a, a, a poor way to approach the problem. That's right. Back in 2006, Cedar Fairs tried to cover up the fact that the Son of Beast was simply unsafe. In my last video, I got called out because, simply put, I criticized King Island for this blunder. However, when we look at the rest of this list, we're going to find that King's Island isn't the first group to ever try to cover up the fact that a ride was unsafe to begin with. In fact, most rides are safe, and you're more likely to be killed by a vending machine than you are of a theme park roller coaster. The big difference is, is that the only reason why you're going to be killed by a roller coaster is because the person managing and upkeeping that ride would rather pay through a lawsuit than make sure that it doesn't kill you in the first place. Pretty much every single accident on this list is preventable. And that's the thing I really want to iterate here. While theme parks are fun and amazing, there's a dark, disturbing truth behind the headlines you see on the news. And today, we hope to explore that. But before we get into that, I would like to talk about today's sponsor, Filmora. A lot of people want to know how to do what I do, and simply put, while I would like to be just a voice actor, editing these videos needs to be done by someone. Filmora is kind of like an alternative to Sony Vegas and, more importantly, Windows Movie Maker. There are tons of stock footage and easy to implement effects that can make your videos look just a little bit more professional than they would otherwise. These transitions are simple to implement and more visual based, so those of you who are visually inclined, Filmora might be a good option for you. All I know is that when I was looking at it, it looked very tempting if I wasn't already married to my program of choice. If you want to start making professional videos or even just videos that look a little bit more visually appealing than what Windows Movie Maker can do, please go to Filmora linked both in the description and pinned in the comments below to get access to not only the program itself but visual effects as well as even sound effects that can be very useful while making your videos. So with that said, sit back, relax, turn down the lights, and prepare to be unnerved in my dungeon as I present 14 of the deadliest theme park accidents that happened throughout history. Transvaal Water Park was a popular African themed water park in Yasinevo, a southern district in Moscow, Russia. Standing as a symbol of the country's bloom of private enterprise, the affluent park featured several heated pools, a sauna, and a stunning overhead glass ceiling. You heard that right, a glass ceiling in Moscow, where I had to withstand incredible pressure from the heavy Russian snowfalls. After only two years of operation, the glass roof collapsed resulting in over 100 injuries and 28 fatalities. The injured were pulled from the rubble by rescue workers in frigid 5 degree weather with only their swimwear to protect them. Bodies were still being recovered into the next day, and three of the fatalities from the incident had been children. Due to the fact that the entire facility was destroyed in the incident, the Transvaal roof collapse remains the most devastating theme park accident to date. The park's architect, Noah Darkincelli, scrambled to place the blame for the collapse on a terrorist attack, citing an explosion despite there being no evidence of such a blast. The cause was, however, faulty design, with several explanations ranging from the accumulation of snow to difference between outdoor and indoor temperatures, and even the seepage of water into the concrete supports.
I can guarantee that unless if you're a roller coaster enthusiast and also German, you'll likely not know about this one, as I have been unable to find any other videos really on the subject, and the few videos that are on it are from like the 1980s and also in German. So with that being said, Hamburger Dom is a German fair held close to the Hamburg Cathedral. This is a fair that's held for a month once every season, so roughly three times a year, and it's been going on for actually quite some time. I'm unsure of the exact history of this fair since a lot of it's undocumented and also what is there is in a language I don't natively speak. What I do know is that in 1981, one of the most insane series of unfortunate events tragically took the lives of seven people and badly injured 15 more. Norbert Witt, age 25 at the time, is unfortunately responsible for the events that were about to transpire. Witt wanted to change out a defective motor. It was 1am and Norbert assumed that the owner to Skylab, also known as a ferris wheel to us, cut off customer flow to the ride. This was a false assumption and one that he didn't check up on. Witt began operating the telescopic crane. Then everything happened kinda fast. When the Skylab should have turned its last rotation, 30 people stepped inside. One of them was a girl and her friend, who were 19 at the time. Later she said, When the gondola rose, I heard rumbling and banging of metal everywhere sparks. From behind her, her friend screamed, Don't turn around, I'm injured. Then finally, the carousel stopped, her friend bloodied. When a few of the gondolas impacted with the telescopic crane, those gondolas were quite literally ripped open as seen here. People fell from great heights onto a metal or concrete floor. Some of the bodies were so badly disfigured from the sudden impact that it took hours to identify them. The victims were between the ages of 18 and 21 years old. And the person you see now is known as Singrid Christensen. This photo was tragically taken right before the deadly incident that ended up taking her life. Not only was this a day no one would want to remember, but the person responsible, Norbert Witt, would never recover from this. He did not have insurance to pay out the damages, totaling in millions, so he had to pay all of it out of pocket. He toured around Europe, putting on fares to try to pay everything back, but in the end, he and his family ended up being forced to run away to Peru where he got into even worse financial troubles. In order to get out, he got involved with smuggling drugs for the mafia. The plan was to smuggle 167 kilograms of cocaine from Netherlands to Germany, so he hid all of it in a steel girder for his flying carpet ride. He was caught in Germany and got imprisoned for seven years. However, his son, who had no idea he was transporting the drugs, was also imprisoned in Peru. Despite pleading with officials stating that he had no idea what his father planted, Peru's new government wanted to set an example and discourage future drug traffickers, so they gave him 20 years. Keep in mind, the max sentencing in Germany is only 15. Upon reflection, this is the last thing Witt had to say after being arrested. Never mind all the times I went bankrupt. Nothing was worse than that night in 1981. I think about it every night. It's crazy to think how a few simple protocols implemented could have prevented everything that happened in the story. From the deaths, to the drug trafficking, to the innocent person now behind bars for the next 20 years. It's amazing to think how a single event sent Norbert and his family's lives down this dark path. Especially considering how one simple change could have seen a completely different fate. After its initial opening in 1930, Luna Park in Glenelg, Southern Australia was relocated to Sydney just five short years later. The reason? 
complaints from local churchgoers that its theme and attractions were too scandalous and that it would attract undesirables. Once in Sydney, though, it was a popular attraction for servicemen during World War II and a relief for Australians still suffering from the Great Depression. Among the rides that were transplanted from Glenelg to Sydney were attractions like Heyday, Tumblebug, the Big Dipper, and of course, the Ghost Train, an early wooden dark ride which took passengers through spooky scenes, complete with creepy sounds and special effects. But on a chilly night in 1979, a fire broke out while 35 people were aboard. Staff attempted to evacuate passengers from the wooden cars, but a lack of sufficient fire suppression protocols or even a basic sprinkler system meant that it took over an hour to get the fire under control. Seven passengers who climbed out of their cars in order to escape through the tunnels were unfortunately unable to do so and were later found dead. The fire would later be labeled an accident with no definitive cause established. It should be noted, however, that the park was able to demonstrate that the fire was not caused by any permanent wiring fixtures or nearby attractions. Instead, the fire was only exacerbated by things like incompetent management who ignored recommendations from a Sydney design consultant to install a sprinkler system for incidents just like this. Among those lost were the husband and two sons of Jenny Godson who only narrowly avoided the fire when she decided to get ice cream instead. Later, upon developing photographs of the family vacation, she uncovered an unsettling photograph of her son Damien. He was posed beside an unidentified man wearing a mask made of cow skin and horns. Such a mask is fashioned in the likeness of the Canaanite god of child sacrifice, Moloch. This discovery led to speculation that this unidentified man may have had a hand in the mysterious fire. In 1987, the National Crime Authority convened an inquiry, the results of which seemed to connect underworld figure Abe Saffron to the tragedy. It was hypothesized that the ghost train fire may have been started as part of a conspiratorial bid to gain control of the park's lease. However, that same investigation found no evidence of the fire being deliberately set. This contradicts an interview with Saffron's niece conducted by the Sydney Morning Herald 20 years later. In it, she claims that the fire had been the result of arson, and she also claimed that nobody was supposed to be hurt in the fire, but whether it was the result of an accident or some down under Scooby-Doo plot to seize the park, the cause of the fire remains an unsolved mystery to this day. What shouldn't be a mystery, however, is the installation of sprinklers, especially in an indoor attraction made out of wood. These seven deaths were preventable beyond that too, as the passengers would have been rescued if they'd known to stay put in their cars in an emergency. Posting simple instructions like that is part of any good safety protocol. Regardless of the source of the fire, park management was completely unprepared, which is why the fire was able to get so out of hand in the first place. And so, seven people died when a dark ride with no sprinkler system or safety instructions went up in smoke. But thankfully though, fire safety standards have improved quite a bit since the end of the disco era. Oakwood Theme Park, located in Wales, is an average theme park. Most of the rides there are in need of refurbishment, food is pricey, and in general rarely gets new attractions outside of general maintenance for the more popular rides. The best you can hope for is retheming for certain rides. One of these popular rides to get the makeover treatment was the Hydro, which is now referred to as Drenched. Some of the rides at this theme park get a paint job because of an overall or for licensing reasons but the Hydro was renamed to distance itself from a very real tragedy, which involves a 16-year-old girl being thrown from the very same water ride, killing her in the process. According to CTV footage, an employee forgot to check if her belt was fastened, and because of that one error, this is what happened. The family of the victim wanted the ride demolished, 
However, it was reopened the following year with new theming and with additional over-the-head safety restraints. The family sued, and in the end, Oakwood pled guilty, forcing them to pay out £250,000 in fines. The death at this mediocre park has led to stricter safety training for all employees and higher safety standards for rides across the board moving into the 2010s. However, it's sad that it took something as awful as this to convince the people behind the park to finally take customer safety seriously. Ring Racer was a launch coaster, which was supposed to be the fastest roller coaster in the world. This ride was also going to be the first ride at the new Neoboard Ring theme park and hotel, with further plans to make this historic raceway into a tourist destination. When opening day came, the Ring Racer still wasn't ready for the public. However, the rest of the raceway's attractions, which included a nightclub, arcade machines, and 4D movies, seemed to do well enough. Workers were forced to work around the clock to make sure the ring racer could hit 135 miles per hour, and when they tried to increase the pressure on the pneumatic launch system, there was a catastrophic blast, launching shrapnel in every direction and destroying the launch pad in the process. The explosion was intense enough to shatter glass 150 feet away from the launch platform and was audible from over 2 miles away. Seven people were injured in total, including six maintenance workers and a hotel employee all of whom consistently showed signs of inner ear damage, resulting in permanent partial hearing loss. This is pretty tame considering what else is on this list. However, what is absolutely disgusting is the attempts to cover up the incident. First aid was given on the spot, but the company refused to call ambulances as they reported that no one was injured. In fact, park management utilized construction company buses to get the injured to the hospital. Four days after this, they put out a report conceding that yes, there was one injury, just one. It would take a further six days to report every injury on site. Throughout all of this, state officials were quick to report that no tax dollars were spent on this project. State Premier Kurt Beck further went on to add that this was entirely privately funded by outside investors. This was a lie, as public funds were used to pay for the majority of the renovations and expenses. State Finance Manager Ingolf Dubell misled Parliament on what exactly the funds were being used for, and in 2012, he was indicted on 14 accounts of embezzlement. Essentially, the taxpayers paid people to lie about a ride's overall safety. Action Park is a anomaly in the fact that there's virtually nothing safe about this park. We're talking about a theme park that had to call 911 so often they had to buy the local hospital more ambulances just to keep up. We're talking about 5 to 10 people daily had to be lifted from the park to the hospital. And while the park admits to doing no wrongdoing, they were always quick to settle many things out of court. A lot of devastating accidents happened here, but instead of focusing on one and telling you the very specific details about why it happened, it's more conductive to explain why all of these accidents happened. Simply put, the park lacked proper training. Most of the employees were teenagers themselves who lacked any sort of safety regulation and furthermore had a steady access to alcohol. This is why, despite having 12 lifeguards at the wave pool, three people still drowned and many more had to be saved. Even though a total of only six people died at this park, all those deaths can be attributed to not only human error, but faulty and cheap ride design and layout. Many of the rides were not designed by actual ride engineers, and furthermore were made of a focus on reduced cost, not quality. That's why rides like the Cannon Loop exist, which had to get a hatch added to it due to many people being unable to clear the loop. Many people on this ride came out with broken noses and busted up faces due to slamming against the loop itself. 
On the kayak experience, a man from Long Island ended up getting electrocuted to death because of exposed wiring in the water, I shit you not. After being tipped out of the kayak, he ended up stepping up on a grate, which completed the current that ended his life. Furthermore, on the topic of water, on the Tarzan rope, the water was far too cold, causing another guest to suffer a heart attack due to shock, which can be caused by a difference in water temperature and air temperature. Many others also ended up passing out on this ride due to the same shock and had to be saved by a lifeguard. The most sinister thing about this park, other than blatant negligence and poor treatment of the staff and the park's unwillingness to take responsibility for anything that happens within its walls, has to be the advertising. Despite being responsible for more than 41% of the injuries and this information being known by Action Park itself, they still advertised it as the safest, most family-friendly attraction at the park, the Alpine Slide. As evidence from this newspaper clipping, courtesy of Defunctland, it shows an article about bragging how a mother and a infant and a kindergartner were able to have fun on this attraction. On the same attraction, on July 8th, 1980, a 19-year-old park employee was riding this very alpine slide when his car jumped a track and his head struck a rock, killing him instantly. This is the same attraction that sees the most broken bones and teeth and is statistically responsible for two to six 911 calls a day during Action Park's peak operation. And despite this, they still said it was safe enough for a mother and a infant to ride. Action Park, in the end, is the most perfect example of what happens when a corporation would rather deal with a lawsuit than spend money to make sure that the ride is safe in the first place. Most, if not all, the deaths listed here could have been prevented should some sort of the simplest precautions be taken. If the staff did not comprise of drunken teens, and if any thought was put into safety, I'm sure a good chunk of these horrible accidents could have been avoided. Magic Mountain is known as the best Six Flags theme park. It currently has the most roller coasters suitable for the kids, and it has a massive amount of thrilling coasters for the grown-ups too. Sure, the park itself needs some updating, and honestly, the actual theming could use a little help too. But considering it's a Six Flags park, and they're the discount chain, it's actually kind of nice. However, Back in 1978, one of those coasters, the Colossus, sadly turned out to be a bit too thrilling. 20-year-old Carol Flores was flung from the original Colossus as it went down a 60-foot drop. The problem was with the lap bar on the ride not being effective enough to keep Carol in her seat. Unfortunately, in the end, she died, and the restraints on the ride were changed the following summer to prevent this sort of thing from happening again. And in a similar incident in 2013, another woman fell 75 feet, again during the steep drop, after being ejected from her seat while riding the Texas Giant at Six Flags Over Texas in Arlington. While it's unknown exactly what caused the accident, it could very well have been a failure with the ride restraints, or possibly improper fitting due to her size. One thing is unfortunately sure though, the theme park in question was unable to comment on what is and is not a safe way to ride these kinds of thrill rides. Over the years, Six Flags has seen quite a number of accidents, ranging from swings colliding with one another and causing injuries, to drownings on a water ride. And that list, it sadly goes on much the same way, often with tragic results. And Six Flags? Well, they're known as the discount theme park chain. Maybe the reasons for that aren't just the low prices, but more so the low safety standards that seem to have been employed throughout the chain's existence.
Oh look, yet another Six Flags ride on this list. Six Flags Kentucky Kingdom was home to the first drop ride of its kind. Originally opening in 1995, the Hellevator was a ride that shot you up, then dropped you down, eventually transitioning to a slow stop and descent. Collectively, they are known as drop rides. In 2007, the Hellevator was rebranded as Superman Tower of Power, and on June 21st of that very same year, a 13-year-old girl was severely injured on that very same tower. When the ride started, a cable snapped. On the way up, the girl managed to unwrap the cable from around her neck, but on the way down, it wrapped around her feet, severing both of them. Doctors were able to reattach her right foot, but the sight was nothing less than horrifying for onlookers. Even though ride operators heard the unusual screaming, the emergency stop was not engaged, nor could it be once it reached the top of the tower. This accident has affected my life dramatically. I was in bed for 10 months and I used to, I mean, I was a 13 year old girl coming into my, you know, I was becoming a teenager and that was taken away from me. My whole eighth grade year was taken away from me. Now, theme park rides are not cursed. You should not be afraid of the attraction itself. You should be scared of those in charge. Six Flags, known as the discount theme park chain, certainly earns its name with this entirely preventable disaster. Before being rebranded as a Harry Potter themed coaster in 2010, the Harry Potter themed Dragon Challenge began its operations in 1999 as a quote, dueling dragons. The ride was initially designed to launch two separate coasters simultaneously, determining the weight of the riders in order to create several near misses between the tracks, one of which caused them to pass within 18 inches of one another. These near misses were a fundamental aspect of the attraction and its design. Of course, when the ride was designed, it wasn't anticipated that riders would board with loose objects, and cell phones in particular. It's not uncommon for today's park goers to attempt to capture pictures or even videos of the coasters they board. These loose objects resulted in several instances of riders being struck during the 60 miles per hour near misses. In one particularly unlucky incident, a 52-year-old visitor from Puerto Rico was struck in his right eye, causing heavy damage and lacerations. While these specifics remained unreleased, statements from park officials heavily imply that he had been hit with a cell phone or other electronic device. The damage was so severe that the eye had to be removed, necessitating the use of a prosthetic. Initially, the ride was rebranded before later being removed altogether for a new Harry Potter one that lacks the bells and whistles from this thrill coaster. For a short time, the dragons remained after this incident, and the coasters were staggered in order to prevent such an incident from repeating. Whether or not a ride design with near misses is a good idea is up for debate, but it's undoubtedly clear that dueling dragons is another nice thing that we lost due to people not being able to par from their phones. These water parks look pretty rad on the face of it. Wave pools, slides, lazy rivers of three locations in one of the hottest states of America, Texas, as well as another location in Kansas. If you were to take a look at these videos and pictures I'm showing you now, you might think that yes, this is a well-themed modern water park that seems to be maintained very well. And you want to know something else? For the most part, you're right. At least when we're referring to 2019. Before 2019, on the surface, everything seemed to be fine until you look under the hood. Then you discover a disturbing truth. In the quest to have the most extreme, eye-catching ride, the Farukt, was constructed. A water slide which name directly translates to crazy or insane. Decapitated a 10-year-old child. Caleb Thomas Schwab, son of State Senator Scott Schwab, both opted to ride the super slide together on elected officials day. Originally, there was a rule that required everyone to be over the age of 14 and to have a collective weight of over 400 pounds. These rules were cut and it's what led to this tragedy. Although everyone sustained injuries, Caleb would not get to see the end of this ride. 
While the park settled with the injured parties, those responsible for the rise construction and overall safety of the water park in general were never able to come to any sort of justice even though they were charged. Luckily for theme park enthusiasts like myself, Cedar Fairs, the company that owns Cedar Point, and many other amazing parks have bought out Slickbin Water Parks chains. And, well, simply put, under their supervision, the parks have gotten a much needed update in both safety, ride integrity, and management, leaving us with many amazing views such as this, and those seen at the beginning of this video. One of the largest state fairs in the United States, the Ohio State Fair is held every July and August in the capital of Columbus. Among its selection of rides was the Fireball, which used a pendulum arm to pivot and swing a gondola wheel lined with rows of seats. And in the summer of 2017, a catastrophic malfunction with this aggressive thrill ride would become the worst tragedy in the history of the fair. During Operation a row of seats was thrown off the ride mid-swing when the gondola crashed into one of the support beams, resulting in six injuries and two fatalities. Tyler Jarrell, an 18-year-old who had recently enlisted in the Marine Corps, was killed after being thrown, and Jennifer Lambert, who was also only 18, was put into a coma that she wouldn't wake up from, passing away a year later. The ride manufacturer determined that excessive corrosion inside the pendulum arm was the cause of the malfunction, though the Ohio Department of Agriculture insisted that the fireball had been inspected and that safety checks weren't rushed. It should be mentioned, though, that when the Son of Beast had its inspection, a ride that injured roughly 20-something people and then was subsequently dismantled, Ohio's Department of Agriculture stated outright that they are, in fact, not ride engineers and would be unable to tell the general public confidently if a ride is safe or not. Attorneys for some of the victims would later file a lawsuit against the Fireball's manufacturer, KMG International, citing a letter sent by the ride maker five years prior to the accident which indicated awareness of a design flaw which could cause corrosion in the steel beam. This letter also instructed ride operators on how to handle the corrosion, including a revised wall thickness requirement for the gondola of 3.8 millimeters. But the measurements that engineers took of the fireball at the Ohio State Fairgrounds? Well, they showed a wall thickness on all gondola arms of as little as one millimeter. The fireball malfunction and tragedy is the result of a defective product designed by a negligent company who fraudulently and intentionally concealed information from the public. By withholding information about this ride's defect from operators and riders, the company behind this cover-up is responsible for two highly preventable deaths just to keep the ride in operation and make a quick buck. The victims have since reached settlements with the ride's owner, Amusements of America, and two private inspection companies that had actually signed off on the ride. Fireball itself was dismantled in September of 2017. Galaxyland in Edmonton, Alberta is an indoor theme park at the Edmonton Mall. It has many rides such as the Space Shop, which is a drop ride, and various family-oriented attractions like a train that runs through the park, bumper cars, etc. It's kind of like Jeepers, except on a larger scale. The biggest attraction is a thrill ride known as the Mind Bender, which is actually still active to this very day. This is surprising considering the accident that happened back in the 80s. On the evening of June 14, 1986, the fourth car of the yellow train derailed before encountering the third and final loop. The cart failed to clear the loop and crashed into a concrete pillar. The damage from this disengaged the lap bars which threw four passengers off the ride, killing three and leaving the fourth in critical condition. Another 19 were treated for less severe injuries at a nearby hospital. 
An investigation into the accident showed that the bolts on the left wheel assembly were loose, and that's what caused the accident. That and design flaws in the actual ride itself. It was also discovered that the ride was poorly maintained. Had it been regularly checked up, this accident would have been prevented. When Mindbender reopened in January 1987, the trains were redesigned. Existing four-car trains were converted into three-car trains, reducing seating capacity from 6 to 12, and anti-rollback features were installed. The lap bar restraint was retained, but seat belts and shoulder headrests were added. Still, this remains one of the deadliest preventable theme park accidents in the history of Alberta. Taiwan is known for many things, and in 2015, Formosa Fun Coast in New Taipei, Taiwan would become known as the scene of one of the deadliest accidents in theme park history. During a Color Play Asia concert held at the park, a dust explosion ignited a massive fireball, injuring over 400 people and killing a further 15. The explosion was not due to an error on the side of the park's management, but rather the Color Play Asia celebration organizers and the colored cornstarch dust which they fired into the audience. Color Play Asia was inspired by the Hindu Festival of Colors, and the organizers wanted to imitate that kind of look and feel. The reason why a giant conflagration took place at Formosa Fun Coast and not during any of the other festivals of color that inspired it? Well, that's down to a few factors. Number one, the Fun Coast music stage is far more closed off space than the wide open areas the festivals are typically held in. And two, the cannons used to fire the cornstarch were overfilled, meaning that the amount of colored dust being expelled far exceeded safe levels. So, when you factor in the super hot stage lights and the fact that people at a concert are prone to using cigarette lighters, a dust explosion was almost inevitable. To make matters worse, this took place at a water park. The water people were actually in got superheated by the flames, causing even more injuries. Some people were dancing in drained pools, which made escape from the explosion and its aftermath much more difficult. Victims were placed into large inflatable rubber tubes since there weren't enough stretchers to go around. Worse still, there weren't enough ambulances to carry everyone, and some people even had to be airlifted back to their home countries just to get medical attention. Organizers of the event had purchased three tons of the powder, the bags of which, upon inspection, were shown to have warnings on them against using it in enclosed spaces or near sources of high heat. Prosecutors charged the event organizer, Lu Chung Chi, with negligence for the disaster. The owners of the park were not indicted. Lu was eventually sentenced to prison. In the end, because 15 people died on his watch, the park's CEO took full responsibility for the incident, despite it technically not being his fault. And one person even ended their life so that they could donate their skin to victims of the tragedy. The park has since reopened to the general public. Considering what happened, it's hard to blame the theme park itself. But there are other items on this list with people far, far more sinister. Originally debuting as a seasonal attraction that used various street performers that played clowns by day, only to transition into vampires and serial killers at night, The Haunted House was a massive hit upon its release. This attraction was such a hit that Six Flags Great Adventure opted to extend its lease and retain the ride throughout the whole year, which we will soon learn was a grave mistake. The Haunted House, as previously mentioned, was stupid popular. What was supposed to be a sideshow for Halloween season ended up seeing thousands of guests a day. As such, it was expanded and opened outside of the Halloween season, and the temporary building itself was extended so that it could fit more guests. 
Because the original design was created with seasonal use in mind, we started to see some cracks in the foundation. The construction was not built to code for a fully permanent standing building, and during the summer months, the flammable materials used to build the building were at risk. To make matters worse, since so many people went through the attraction at all hours of the day, various safety equipment was vandalized at all times. Six Flags would be forced to replace things like fire alarms and other equipment over and over and over again until Six Flags just threw their hands up in the air and didn't see the value in replacing it anymore. So for many years while this ride was up, they just didn't replace it at all. A fire began in the attraction on May 11th, 1984, 6.35 p.m. Fanned by the building's air conditioning, it spread quickly due to the use of flammable building materials. Roughly 29 guests were in the attraction at the time. 14 made it out alright, though 7 others who escaped had to be treated for smoke inhalation. 8 students, all belonging to the same class, were burned alive so badly that their bodies were practically unrecognizable. When discovered, they were originally mistaken for mannequins. Paramedics even had to put them in special body bags so that that mistake would not be made a second time. A state panel investigating the fire said that the regulatory system had failed at almost every level and that the haunted castle had been in violation of a dozen state fire safety codes. If this place had any form of safety measure, such as a sprinkler system, fire alarms, smoke detectors, etc., anything, it's possible that those eight students who lost their lives could still be here today. Unfortunately, as evidenced by Six Flags negligence, those lives weren't worth the cost of a fire alarm. Wow, it looks like you made it to the end of yet another really long video. I'd like to first thank my Patreon supporters, starting with The Mask, Tara Workman, Matthew, and Willow Firefox. And then i also like to thank my $20 supporters, Alani, Nashashi, Seuss Party, Sparanis, and Luna. And thanks to everyone else who's been donating. Every little bit helps. If you guys have any ideas for what sort of video I should do next, please let me know. But my current thought process is doing a Aggretsuko Season 2 Explained, as well as maybe a list about the best story-based video games. I was also thinking about revisiting Night in the Woods. Whatever. Anyway, if you guys have any suggestions or ideas, please let me know. I'm open to new stuff and honestly I just want to find something that I feel creatively interested in with that said please have a good one and I hope you guys have a beautiful life have a good one